Welcome to this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live, the show which ensures that you profit from your time spent here with experts, either through the industry insights, information, or simply learning from them. And today we have Stephen Turner, executive employee, leadership expert, and president of the Flow Business Solution. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thank you very much, AJ. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Welcome to India. And I'm sure across the world where this show is going on right now and later people will certainly benefit a lot from what you have to say. You are a veteran of industry. You have worked with UPS for the 35 year plus career there. So, so many things you did at a top level and there is so much to share. You are a winner in your life and I'm sure a lot of corporate people can certainly take help uh, with what you have to say and make their lives better and employees life better. So let me begin uh, the show with this question, uh, Stephen. In the backdrop of the great resignation, and some people say it might just go away. So who do you think with the state of the economy, with the state of the great resignation, and with the state of the, uh, with the corporate life, who will win? Is it employees? who uh, employees will come back to work or is it that the corporate itself will have to change to include the aspirations of millions of employees who want the work-life balance? Yeah, my opinion is, and I, I, I speak from uh, experience, to be honest, and that is that uh, unless the uh, management philosophy changes, generally speaking, because there are exceptions, but generally speaking, um, unless the management philosophy that tends to permeate throughout the corporate world, and I can go through a whole dis, you know, discussion on that topic, um, if it doesn't change, it's going to run out of people. And the, uh, the pandemic kind of ignited the fire, yet the fire has been, the embers of the fire have been there for, uh, believe it or not, about 120 years. So it's... Right. Employees are in a really good position at this point, but I, I'm a proponent strongly of uh, treating employees the way they, they would like, that people would like to be treated. And as a result of that, you find people that are cooperating with us instead of fighting us. And if I could say this, uh, I, there are two approaches with employees, generally speaking. Either number one, you can manage them or you can lead them. If you manage them, they tend to resist. When you lead them, they will follow. And that has a huge impact on any business in any industry. Right, Stephen. Right. We'll come to that. You you have talked about it. You know, there is a difference between managing them and leading employees. But Absolutely. first to understand. Why have we come to this state when the workplace is the same? How are the visions different? What is it that the corporate wants? What is it that employees want? Don't corporates also want what employees want? Where is that uh, that path breaking uh, breaking up? And then everybody is making, because that's a big statement. You say that mm -hmm. corporates might run out of employees in the longer run. Uh, so uh, uh, you mean to also say that they they are just not thinking about great resignation, but they are also resigned to their fate then and doing nothing about it. Uh, one needs to be wise in dealing with this uh, situation today. Um, this really goes back a long, long ways. And if I can take you all the way back to um, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, what happened here was, and this is really uh, the start of it, and I think it's the seed that was planted that caused the rest to happen over time. Uh, if you could take, if you consider that um, at the beginning, we lived in an agrarian society. In other words, farmers. And when farmers did their work, they basically had one or two crop or livestock cycles a year. They would when the time came, they would go to the bank and they might borrow some money so they can buy some seed or they can buy some livestock. They would then go through the entire cycle of raising whichever. At the tail end, they sell 
the money they get, they go back, they pay off the banker, and they then live on the money until the cycle starts over. So that means that a farmer or somebody in a, a society like that probably might, might only get paid twice a year. So in those two payments, they learn to manage money. And another very important piece of this is that people are making their own decisions. Farmers run their own lives, right? Nobody else is telling them what to do. So now as progress came and we moved into the Industrial Revolution, uh, which I'm all for progress, so don't don't anybody take this incorrect, in, uh, incorrectly. But the point is, when farmers move from the farm into the in industry, they were no longer making their own decisions. They were, in fact, doing what somebody else told them to do. That's one thing. And I'm going to come back as to what's important about that in a second. Secondly, they got paid maybe once a week, one, you know, a couple times a month, whichever. So now it started to plant the seed of living paycheck to paycheck, which granted farmers did the same thing, but their cycle was months long and it would cause them to have to manage money. So as a result of this, the ability of an employee or man to impact their life was significantly reduced. And business leaders, and I'm not saying it was intentional because I'm sure it wasn't, but business leaders missed this. So when, when people came into the, in, into the um, industry to work, they had no say in what they were doing. Now, the important thing with that concept is this. We were created to, with a desire to rule our lives. Right. Because if we weren't, we would not be successful as individuals. So we're created to be successful. And uh, if you take this further down the road into the 1860s, labor unions started. And labor unions came directly out of the desire for employees to have more say in their lives. Now, it goes to the next level. In 1895, there was a gentleman, last name of Taylor, who was a proponent of running businesses by numbers. Now, that's not to say that business leaders didn't watch numbers because they have to watch numbers because they need to accomplish a result. But what happened was this gentleman became really the, the, recognized as, as the business world's first um, industrial engineer. But the problem was that the focus was so on numbers, it became the only focus. So now the, the, the employees as individuals, that wasn't even considered. Now it's simply generate a number and you're getting paid to generate a number. And that, that mentality has been in place since 1895. You want me to keep going? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But you okay. are talking, talking okay. a lot of sense. And I guess uh, some a lot of people who are not talking sense they get some sense and they leave a bit of nonsense from their life, understand this sense and put all the lives together in a better manner so that right. uh, nothing gets resigned to pay it and the great resignation also does not happen in the way that is happening. Yeah. So when you consider this, the, the, the one of the real challenging things here is that uh, generations of leaders, one after another after another, have been raised in this same situation. They've been raised in the same mentality. Consequently, there's no motivation, or there's no uh, outside impetus to change the process. Okay, lo and behold, a statistic starts to show up. In 1990, the Gallup organization started to produce a number. It was called the, well, it was described as 85% uh, of employees are not fully engaged in their work. Now, okay, that's a number. That's a fact. Okay. Um, then people like me, biz business consultants or whoever, stand up and say, this is how you fix the problem. But nothing happens because people get, they hear the number, they get excited for a couple, three months. Then because of two flaws in the approach, and I'll tell you what they are, 
because of two flaws in the approach, everybody falls back to the status quo. Nine more months later, the whole thing starts over. And it just keeps going like that. So the number hasn't changed in 32 years. Now, why is that? Usually, the only way anything can ever change is two things have to occur. Number one, you need to know where you're starting from. Now, if I heard a statistic, if I heard a statistic, my first reaction just might be, oh, that doesn't apply to me. Not my organization. My people love me, right? So they don't, they don't, even, they don't give it much consideration. If they felt they had a problem, they might pay attention to somebody like me standing up and telling you this is what you need to do. But you can't get, you cannot move from where you are to where you need to be until you know where you are. And this can be done through outside organizations that do employee surveys to figure out what is the attitude and the status of the employees in a given organization. And when they do that, they can find out where they are. But that doesn't happen very often. Now, if you don't know where you are, there's no way you're ever going to produce a roadmap to give anybody a solution as to where, with a journey they have to take to get to where they need to be. Consequently, nothing changes. And consequently, we have 32 years of the same number. Right. So that, that's how we are, where we are, and why we're where we are today. Okay, now, I want to um, digress here just for a moment. And that has to do with what, what what I I developed my leadership style when I was at UPS, and it was almost almost I almost stumbled into it really, because and I'm I'm giving you the reason why I believe so strongly in what what I'm saying here. When I got started, I was on the management team at UPS when I was 20 years old. And I was, I was managing a group of uh, college-age kids, basically. And, uh, but there's, there's one thing unique. When you're 20, 21, and 22 years old, nobody wants to report to somebody that's younger than them. It doesn't matter when you're in 40s and 50s, right? But when you're 20 years old, heaven forbid, I'm going to listen to somebody that's two years younger than me. But that's the scenario I had. So... I had a choice to make. I had to figure out how was I going to make this work so that those folks, and I had about 20 people reported to me that were almost all older than I was. So I decided to do this. I simply said, I'm going to treat them the way I would like to be treated. And if I did that, it would be my best chance of success. And the nice thing is it worked then. It worked every year thereafter. So for the 34 years that I was on the management team of UPS, I followed the same process, and it worked every time, everywhere. Uh, I spent time in um, the operations world, moving packages around. I spent 17 years in finance and accounting, and I spent 13 years in the technology world of UPS, helping to build uh, computer systems. But no matter where I was, no matter what operation I was in, and then there's one more factor here. I spent five years in Europe during UPS's international expansion the, at the very beginning of it. Right. And I, I covered, I uh, had responsibilities in 10 countries over there. Yeah, you were a finance director. Yep. Everywhere from the Nordic countries, so Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, down through uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, down to Greece and Turkey. And Ireland over on the, other, on the other side. Right. And I discovered something. Now, the, the funny thing is, while I was over there, I didn't even think of this. But in retrospect, I realized this had happened. It doesn't matter where we are. Cultures vary, but hearts don't. Right. People here always wanted, number one, want to do good work. And they want to be appreciated and they want to feel capable of doing more. 
and they want to they want to know where they fit in the big picture so they are a member of a team and if we would just take care of those things right there those are pretty broad encompassing uh factors if we as leaders would take care of that we would be much better off so um i follow that philosophy now we're into the we're into the entrepreneurial world here and it doesn't matter the size of the business it doesn't matter the business People are the same all over, and it's uh, it's a massive key. Right, right, Stephen. You talked of two points. One was about that how you succeeded when you were 20, 22 years old with those mm -hmm. older employees. One was that your mantra was that how you wanted to be treated, you treated. Now this is something we have in our books, our yep. school books. Yep. Do unto others. As you want something like that, you want them to treat you. Do unto you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do unto you. Isn't it? And you implemented it. What is stopping leadership, corporate leadership in doing this? And how do you, uh, when you did that, how exactly you implemented it? I'm sure a lot of people are doing it, but how did it actually impact things on the ground? Second thing is, again, you were right, you were right that Cultures different, uh, differ, but hearts are the same. Mm -hmm. Why is it that companies' culture, the heart becomes, uh, you know, almost like heartless? People become heartless. Yeah. Is it yeah. the loss of empathy? Is it the more more coming of AI, different computers? What is it? Is it that our society, just like we don't know, know our next door neighbor, that's actually moving that same culture is moving into our offices and we really, really don't care how does it work then why do why do people talk about business practices best business practices happy families corporate great corporate culture you know what is this thought leadership i've spent several years in many years in journalism when i was just 22 23 i started in journalism after my masters so i've been listening to all those thought leadership lectures in print in agency in television why is it so when things can be used? You say, you know, uh, that employees have not have been, uh, people have been undervalued. Why yeah, it has happened? For sure, without a doubt. So put us in, put these things into perspective so that there is something that comes out of it. And I know I, my show does not have a billion uh, followers or something, but whatever number of people do listen to this, watch this, and especially employees and budding you know, managers and even some leadership, uh, they can make some sense out of what you are talking about. Well, that's a really long question. So let's uh, take yeah. it in pieces. All right. Right. First of all, I want to go back and I want to go back to my story again. And I already said that uh, I followed this pr process my entire life. And it's over 45 years now between the corporate and the entrepreneurial world. But people react to being cared for. And unfortunately, there is a stigma inside business that says that your personal life is one place and your business life is another, right? We can say that, right? Because, but the problem is, it isn't real. People, they have their personal lives with them all the time. And when they go home at night, their business life follows them. Right. So there is no breaking the two. So you're better off in uh, supporting the fact that people have a personal life and it's important to them. Here's one of the tests. When people go home at night and walk in the door, walk in the door and their significant other, whoever that happens to be, says, how was your day, dear? And if you can give a positive answer, you're in a good place. If you have a negative answer, that negative answer is going to spoil the evening for one thing because that's going to be the focus but if you can go home every night and your your spouse or whoever says how was your day dear i had a great day the evening is going to be just as good okay that's the the personal life of of it all right and the importance of it one of the things i mentioned before was that business leaders have been raised in the same environment for 120 years so unless something happens that causes somebody to consider something different, 
They're just going to repeat, re replicate themselves. So it's understandable how it happens. But the challenge is, do you want to ex do you do you want to take the steps to make it better? Now, I can talk about this from a gazillion different angles, but let me bring up one that I think is very important. When we look at when CEOs and you know business owners look at their operation, they have a responsibility for success. They owe it to themselves. They owe it to the share owners if they're CEOs. And they need to keep their eyes on the numbers. However, they forget that it's people that generate them. So if business leaders would continue the way the business started, and this is one of the funny things about this, every major corporation, UPS included, with its 500,000 employees, I think it is now, they all started with one person. UPS actually started with four. But it's still, it's a small operation, right? It's small business. Now, if you can just imagine, if you're a small business owner and uh, your business starts to grow and you hire people, who's going to do the hiring? Me. I'm hiring my people. So I have an opportunity on day one to know these folks and to nurture them and train them so they're successful in the business. And the business owner and the employee work side by side. And it works like that until you get to maybe they have six or seven employees by this time. Uh, now the business owner needs to back off a little bit so that he can do what he needs to take care of, he or she. So he takes one of the people that he has, that he has hired them all, knows them very well, and makes them a manager. So one of them oversees the day-to-day -day operation. Okay, everything's good so far. Well, the business keeps growing. More people are added. Now the business owner is no longer doing the hiring, but the manager or maybe two managers or whatever. Now here's the flaw. And this is, this is where this starts to break down. And once it starts to break down, it just keeps rolling. The business owner never ever, hardly ever, as I better say, gives due consideration to the fact that somebody else is doing the hiring. Now, the business owner probably did not teach the manager how to hire somebody. Because when you hire as an owner, that's one approach. When you hire as a hired hand, that's different. It's not the same connection. But they can be trained to do it correctly. Okay. Now, if the business owner had trained the manager on how to hire people, how to nurture them, how to train them and make them successful, and that process was replicated, the situation that exists today would be a lot, a lot easier. So small business owners, through no fault of their own, they just take their eye off the ball and they just don't, they don't deal with it. They, doesn't, they don't even think of it. So one of the things we do is we try, we're, we're, we're bringing this up as an issue at the small business level, right? But we're also going reaching out into corporations again to bring up this uh, message. Now, part of the message is the testimony of my career. And some people will find it a little bit, well, almost unbelievable. But there is a number, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this as the, 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 the CEO element of this discussion. It costs a lot of money to replace employees. In fact, uh, based on some averages that the, in the United States, the average salary is about $54,000 a year. Um, about 9.7% of employees turn over every year. Some retire, you know, somebody move on to other things, but whatever, there's a 9.7% turnover rate. And generally speaking, it takes six to nine months to of, of salary, additional costs to the business to replace somebody. Now, if you just take the averages and any CEO can take the averages and, you know, change the numbers to match their situation. Right. But if you had a, a 100, 000, excuse me, a thousand employee uh, business with 9.7% 9 9 turnover, $54,000 a year salary and seven and a half months to replace them, the cost wise, it would cost them three point, 
uh, six, three point six million dollars a year, a year, every single year, to replace nine point seven percent of your employees, or ninety seven out of the thousand that I used in the example. Okay. So if I came to you and I said, how would you like to save half of it? Now you're into $1.6 million a year of saving. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? But, you know, that would, be, that would assume about uh, a 4.8% turnover rate. I'm going to share with you what my turnover rate was at UPS. It was almost zero. Why? Because I treated people the way they'd like, I would like to be treated. And the nice thing is people like it. And if you treat them correctly, they will follow you. I, I believe strongly in the concept that if I take care of them, they will take care of me. It has never failed. You know how that happens in a given environment, you know, that, you know, is obviously worth discussing, right? But the bottom line is the same. And anybody can have it. You know, I'm not special. I just happen to follow that approach. So no matter where I was, I had very little turnover. I spent very little money replacing anybody. And if anybody left my work group, it was usually because they wanted to better themselves and I did not have a, I didn't have a job for them, which, hey, great, you know, take off. Because I, anybody that want, that moves on to better themselves did a really good job while they were there. And I'll take that any day. Absolutely. Now, um, let's see, what else could I tell you to answer your question? All right, the, the here is um, here's a challenge as well. Now, keep in mind, I said it's been about 120 years we've been in this uh, rut. CEOs don't change overnight. People don't change overnight, but they can change. It's called mindset, but it takes a little bit of practice, but it can be done because. I did it many times with all the people that reported to me at UPS over the years. So if we're having a conversation with a CEO and I bring up a number or bring up something they're sensitive to, which is why I brought up the employee turnover rate issue. If I come to them and I make a make reference to this number, which is applicable to everybody, and I can encourage a CEO to think about that number. How would you like to have it be half that money, that much? That would be a motivation from his or her perspective to at least take a look at it, right? And then you got to cover the two, the two uh, challenges that I said are out there. Number one, you have to know where you are. I mean, you can't get from, I cannot get from here to New York City on a given road, unless I know where I'm starting from, right? It's the same thing. So as soon as the CEO discovers, let's see, where am I really in this scenario? What do my employees really think? Because here's another thing that I haven't even talked on yet. As organizations grow, the space between the employees that do the work and the leader gets greater and greater as layers of management are added. So now, from the CEO's perspective, he needs people that take care of the people. He's not going to do it. He'll take care of his own team. He'll take care of his, the, his direct reports. They'll take care of theirs. But this breaks down. It breaks down quickly. So um, it's important to shift the mindset to the degree where I want to take care of my people so they don't want to leave. Because if you had an employee engagement, and I, I believe this is very attainable, instead of 85% being not or only partially engaged, what if 85% were engaged? I mean, you'd have less turnover, you'd have better quality services or products, whichever, you'd have a great working environment because you would encourage people 
to communicate with each other uh, and business owners and leaders would have the people that report to them as tremendous sources of information. So I'll throw this out there. You know, we have, uh, <clears throat> there is a, a, a phrase out there, a concept that says, in the abundance of counselors, there's victory. Now, I'll tell you what, and this is very few people think of this. In the abundance of counselors, there's victory. What if your employees were actually some of your counselors? Right. Why? They do the work every day. If there's a problem in the work they're doing, and if there's an open line of communication, they're going to come to me and say, Steve, we're having an issue with this. Can we find a better solution? The answer, well, yes, let's find a better solution, right? And it's just having open dialogue like that creates a lot of flow. You have everybody's thinking instead of one person thinking. It, right. just, it, just, it just goes, right? And then, of course, uh, once you know where you are, you then put a plan together to, act, to actively pursue the pieces of the puzzle that need to be changed in the business so that uh, people can be successful. And uh, that can be done. That's cause it requires a mind shift change, but it's also education. It's uh, humility as well. You have to be willing to change before anybody changes. So that's a long answer to your question, I think. <laughs> if I missed anything, please ask. Yeah, you, you uh, through great perspective into this whole thing and that's a human perspective and it's it, it, it's like going back to the basics and all mm -hmm. it, therein lies the answers and fairly fairly it is very fair that uh, people have to look at that particular position uh to get the answers now let's look at what exactly is the ceo mindset in 2023 and in a company uh, a lot several companies have also tried this concept of employees first some have succeeded. I don't know what exactly uh, is the inner situation in such companies, but you would be able to uh, tell more about this. The companies who are thinking about this concept of employees first. Even in India, several companies have not. Second thing is that a lot of work culture has to do with mid-level managers mm -hmm. who have to take care of their uh, subordinates or colleagues. Yeah. In, so, in armed forces, if you look, Stephen, mm -hmm. they are even smaller teams. They are the team leaders take care of their team, and then it, it it's all across the whole uh, whole process. Uh, I, any any of these armed forces, if you take it. So, is it a failure of the CEO, or is it the mindset of the uh, mid-level managers? How do you want to see this thing, and how does this? Uh, who actually? Is responsible for the work culture. Then, is it is it the human resource department? Is it that CEO whose eyes also again on the numbers, and he has to uh, always look up to the board exactly what they will be uh, expecting. How does it work? I'm trying to find a hope amidst all these things so that you know everything becomes uh, I hear you. moved towards the better thing. A change like this <clears throat> has to come from the top because it's too deeply embedded and too deeply rooted in the organization. So as much as, <clears throat> excuse me, as much as an, a middle level manager can certainly have an impact on their working environment. I mean, <clears throat> even if the CEO did not come down and say, here, shift gears, and this person like me, Right. I started working, I just, this the way it went. So a middle manager can start the process and working uh, with their people so that they are recognize them as individuals, right? However, for the entire organization to change, it has to come from the top. It's too ingra ingrained in the business. So um, it, it could be, that a CEO might decide he wants to do something and he assigns the work to the HR department, which would make sense. That's fine. But that person at the top 
has got to bless the process, has to in, empower people to make changes. And then very importantly, he has to support the changes that come in. So personally speaking, I think it's much more effective if we can uh, basically get the ear and the attention of CEOs who realize they need to make a change and then start there and then work it down through his entire organization, through the C-suite, through the upper level managers, all the way down to the ground floor. And, you know, one of the one of the more difficult jobs to have in an organization is the frontline supervisor. Here's the poor guy or lady who has the number command coming down from the top. When it gets to that poor that person right there, he's the one that needs to send the message out to the employees that actually generate the results. And he has no clue what to do. He's stuck. So he's giving the people that need to be nurtured and trained and supported a command. And let's go back to what I said at the very beginning. People have a hard time being told what to do. Now, that's not to say that you don't you do the things you need to do for what your job is. But here, this heart right here wants to have an impact on what this thing does, thinking. Right? So it's got, I, I believe, to be most effective. It needs to come from the top. And one thing about corporations, and this is different from when I was at UPS because I was running my, whole, my own operation. So whether I had four people or 200, um, I was in charge of the whole thing. I could make the whole thing work. In an organization like a corporation that has its large plus many layers, there needs to be accountability tools in place so that people, that the CEO knows that what has just been instilled and just been trained uh, through all the management people and now touching the people on the street, that that's still going. And so we do that by setting up some key uh, KPIs, key performance indicators, and just monitor it over time and let the CEO see that certain things that need to happen to make sure employees are uh, developed individually, which is what this all is about, that he can see that's happening. If he can see it's happening, he'll be good, right? So where, again, when I was in it myself, it was just me, I had it all. But from his perspective, his or her perspective, to make sure the organization is following the program, there are accountability tools put in place to make sure that CEO gets the answer to that question. Right, Stephen, right. Is it is it the, uh, what is lacking in the leadership, Stephen? Is it uh, inefficiency? Obviously, they cannot be inefficient if they're coming from good places, well-trained, or is it the mindset? Is it a lack of empathy? Or simply people just don't care they, because they know that, uh, especially leadership, if you say the buck stops there, is that they need to move out uh, move out of the, this company to another bigger company in, say, a couple of years. How does it work? Okay, bottom line is there isn't enough focus on developing individuals as people. Now, you can go back and say it's a mindset issue. I can tell you that it's because of 120 years being in the same place. So people just replicating themselves. But the bottom line is the piece that's missing is the fact that employees are not <clears throat> developed individually so they can accomplish their own goals while also accomplishing the business's goals. And I think the easiest way to look at this, rather than, than having me say it that way, look at it this way. When an employee gets started, I, I believe fully, let me just tell you this. It's interesting. I'm actually doing a presentation on this in about a month. How to, how to retain employees. Retaining employees, which is again going back to the number of the, the money spent on employee turnover, right? The best way to retain employees starts on day one when they step, first walk in the door. Because when employees get started on day one, people are employees are the most moldable on day one. Now, if we if we as leaders take advantage of day one, and we first of all first thing we do is explain to an employee 
where you fit in the big picture. Why are you here? So once the employee gets a feel, okay, this is my job, and this is where I fit into this group of 10 people, which is part of this organization of 100 people, I'm good. I know what I'm, why I'm here. Then we, we train them well. And we train them so that they know the job so well that they become capable, they feel themselves capable of doing more. And anytime you have an employee who feels they're capable of doing more, you have a, a, a person that you could hand additional responsibility to, more delegation, uh, et cetera. But here's an important piece. One of the things that employees hate the most, and I can tell you this from a survey of 2,400 people, employees, they hate the annual review <laughs> because all it is is an exercise to put a check mark on a box that says that, yes, I gave this person a, a review this year. Well, guess what? That does nothing but irritate people. Because if I had employees, and this is <clears throat> the review process is a progression. You don't bring somebody on board, you know, get them trained so they're rolling along. And then all of a sudden come to them and say, okay, we're going to have a review in one year. What does that do? Nothing. But reviews, review cycles are based upon where the employee is at the moment. So when they get started, they, they, got, they got all the initial training done. And then we come back and we say, okay, let's take a look at what happens in the next week. And if you have any questions, please ask so we can stop the bleeding as quickly as possible. Right? Then we're going to get to the point after they've been around for a while, they feel comfortable and we're comfortable with them, we can ask them a question. And here is the question. Where would you like to be in five years? Now, you'll probably get a deer in the headlights look like, what? So you can back it off. How about three years? Have you thought about where you'd like to be in the future? Well, as soon as you ask the question, you have just told the employee that you care about him personally. Right? I care enough to ask you. Now, when that employee, well, however they answer the question, and they may not answer it at all the first time you ask. But the next time you do your next review, which you determine that because of where they are, you know, and let's sit down and have a chat in about a month. You ask the question again, you might get an answer. What's the point? If you know where that person would like to be at the end of their whatever, five years, and you have the ability within your organization to move them along their personal journey while at the same time also taking care of the uh, business. And many, many times these things work together. You are now building an employee that has self-worth, self-esteem, self people with self-esteem are the most successful people out there because not only can they do what they're doing well, they're willing to do something more because they have confidence in themselves. And we have every opportunity to build that relationship and confidence in people. So. Right. Right, Stephen. In your, you know, you have a uh, approach, which is proven one. When you share it with companies, what is their response? Obviously, some companies are good. They would be they say, what are the companies who actually need uh, your help? What is their response? Well, when I tell them my story, most people find it pretty amazing. Because I, I tell it basically like this to do it in a, in a nutshell. I start where I did before, 20 years old. Right. And then I walk through what's happened and give testimonies on things that happened in my life. Here's I'll give you one. I remember uh, when I was I had been on this this particular I see I've been in the management team for UPS for about eight years at the at this point. Seven years, seven years. It was January 1st of the year in question. And I walked in and I, took, I decided I'm going to bring my whole group together and I'm going to tell them what I would like to accomplish over the next year. I had my peers telling me I was nuts because I told them I was going to do this. I did it anyway. 
Now, I had a relationship with these folks. It wasn't the day one, right? I've been working with them for probably three months at this point. I sat down to go through the whole thing. And the, the, the best thing happened could possibly have happened. The senior person in the group had been there the longest, longer than me, stood up and she said, we're behind you, Steve. We want you to be successful. And that was it. And those types of things happen. I mean, I have, uh, I'm doing this by, I'm giving examples, right? Because anybody can do this. This isn't the Steve Turner, uh, the only way of doing, the only one that can do this is I went into an, I went into an operation for two years, took it from the bottom to the top. This was an organization, an office at UPS that had never had anybody promoted from there in five years. We ended up with five upper level promotions coming out of the group. Why? Because we worked together to solve the issues. And as a result, they knew what they were doing. And they knew they could do better. One of those promotions was the guy that took my job because then I went off to someplace else. But that's what you create when, when we train people to be successful. And we did it through a real teamwork event there because there was 100 and, oh, about 120 people in this operation. So we just had everybody involved. And everybody got better. Now here, remember I told you about no turnover? I didn't lose one person in those two years. I didn't have anybody I had to let go because they weren't willing to do the work. The problem in the office was nobody was draw we're drawing out the abilities that they had. And that's what we did. We, the team, got it done. We, so I just tell know. those stories. And they say, really? 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 I said, yeah, really. And this is how you get there. Because the first phase... The, there's two phases to this. Number one is the where's this thing? Where is the heart? Many many management people find this challenging because they've been around, raised in the old way. To sit there and, and talk employee empowerment, which was a buzzword from the early 80s, um, they have a hard time with it. They just they can't get the concept in their brain, right? But here's the question. Here's a question that can always bring people back. What if it was the person you report to came to you and asked you these questions? How do we like to be treated? You know, we can be really uh, direct. I'm going to say too direct with people telling them what to do as opposed to inspiring them to do things. But when it comes to us personally, I want the conversation. I don't want the dictation. So we can always put ourselves in the employee's shoes and determine how would I like to be treated? Right, right. So those companies, uh, Steve, who, who want to take your help, how do they connect with you? Those leaders who really want to uh, bring that change for the better? Well, if they want to find us, they can, uh, they can call me at my office, which is uh, 267 seven five three five five six eight in the usa um you can reach come to our website you can always leave an email or excuse me a uh, an email there and our website is www flow hyphen business hyphen solution dot com singular solution singular and there's a contact form in there that somebody can uh and fill out. We also have um, an audio series on our website that's uh, available at the top of the website. You can see there's a blue bar there that talks about a free video that will introduce people uh, into this concept. And then it's really a great tool for uh, small business owners who want to get off on the right foot. Uh, we also work with corporations. Uh, the videos will, will give them the picture of it all. But, you know, to shift an org, uh, a corporation, you know, takes a little bit more effort, but that's okay. That's why we're here. Right, right. That's what you are here, and you are yeah. here.
to make that difference yep. so that lives become better. Exactly. My last question to you, Steve, is sure. that you are a man of heart. You talk about heart, and that is where the real mm -hmm. matter lies. Yeah. What is your heart telling you now? What is it that you seek for yourself? You have achieved so much in life. Now you are uh, the president of Flow Business Solution. What is it actually that you seek now? What does well, your heart tell you? Uh, I am seeking what we are. We built. We made another company called Beyond Resilience. I am the COO of that. Right. So I, we joined together. We have a, we just, we're just getting this thing started. But the point is to go heavy duty into corporate America, and uh, to really make an impact. And our purpose of this business is to change people's lives, so that employees are motivated, and so that leadership teams have successful businesses. Because one of the things that's going to be very challenging going into the future. And we already see it from the great resignation where 45 million people have left their corporate jobs in the last 18 months. That means there's fewer people for CEOs to rely on for growth. So if you just figured that I need X number of people to keep my business going in the current plan, not to mention growing in the future. So wouldn't it be really nice if you could grow with the same number of employees because your turnover rate has been significantly reduced, it'll just be easier. But it takes a decision to get there. But that's where my heart is, to give people opportunities to shine. Wonderful. Wonderful. On this positive note, it's a wrap on this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. Thank you, AJ. I appreciate it. Had a good time.